In 1919, Adolf Hitler had in a matter of months essentially turned the tiny German Workers' Party into his own, and then, soon, he took personal control of it, himself. The other tired old men in the group did almost nothing except sit around and talk in dingy back rooms, whilst Hitler stepped up and made rousing speeches to the public, winning over thousands to his National Socialist cause. After some major up and downs, such as the failed beer hall putsch and Hitler going to prison for it, the formula generally remained the same. Speak openly to the people of Germany, speak to them directly, and they will follow you. By 1930, the NSDAP was the second biggest party in the country and rising fast. Adolf Hitler had visited basically every city or major town in the nation and won the party a gigantic base of support. The people saw in him something different. They were used to a political class who were more professional liars than professional politicians. Each year, things got worse, and when the Wall Street crash came along, the German people had had enough. Chancellor Brüning was useless, and his policies only made things worse. Then came a series of other chancellors with not much else to add. The people only wanted one man, the man who spoke personally to them one-on-one, -on -one, and they were willing to overlook some of his harsher views to get him into office. In January 1933, that moment came. President Hindenburg had tried to resist as hard as he could, and others around him had engaged in many petty political games to use or sideline Hitler, but nothing worked. The public support just grew and grew, and by the 30th of January, the tired old man could take it no more, and he swore Adolf Hitler into power, now the leader of the most popular party in the country. After 14 years of struggle, the National Socialists had got Adolf Hitler into power, and now he had to fulfil the many promises he had made to the German people, and to the party itself. Before we begin, this video is part of my larger series on the life of Adolf Hitler, going all the way from the day he was born up until the day in the bunker in 1945. The video can be viewed just as easily on its own, however, if you're interested in the first year of Hitler's reign. If you want to start watching from the start, however, the link to the playlist is in the description or front and centre on my channel homepage. Secondly, a quick disclaimer. This is a series about Hitler, so to some, this is immediately controversial. Please use common sense. Quotes are obviously not my own, and I am not expressing any opinions of my own in this video. Thank you. And lastly, a huge thank you to my patrons who make these videos possible. I will be going full-time on YouTube in around a month's time from this video's release, and without their help, this would be an extremely uphill battle, so they are really saving my ass, and it means the world. If you do have a few spare dollars laying around, and you'd like to support the channel, then please do consider clicking the link in the description to join my Patreon or my subscribe star. Any amount helps gigantically. Thank you. On January the 31st, 1933, the morning after his sudden appointment as Chancellor, Hitler took a moment to reflect. He stood in his window at the Kaiserhof Hotel, looking out, thinking about last night's parade. Then, a woman entered the room and handed him some flowers. It was Mrs. Goebbels, Joseph's wife. He took the bouquet with a quote, solemn gesture, and then said, These are the first flowers, and you are the first woman to congratulate me. Now, the world must realise why I couldn't be Vice-Chancellor, how long my own party members did not understand me. Yes, now I must remain by myself for some time. And he continued to look out of the window in deep thought. Perhaps he had not yet processed that after all of these years of struggle, he was now finally Chancellor of Germany. Nearby, others were already scheming to use Hitler for their own ends, however. Papen, the man who had got Hitler into this position in the first place with his schemes, said to his close circle, We have hired him for ourselves. What do you want? I have Hindenburg's confidence. Within two months, we will have pushed Hitler so far into the corner that he will squeak. The elite Junkers class, embodied by Papen, thought that now they had a ticket back to the past, where they had an authoritarian rule over Germany. Hitler, however, had no interest in being a puppet for fancy nobles, and he had a far different vision of the near future. He immediately set about laying the foundations for a dictatorship, and managed to get Papen to persuade Hindenburg to dissolve Parliament so new elections could be held. Even despite making moves like this, Many influential people or organisations saw things just like Papen did, and understandably so. From the outside looking in, Hitler looked like a mere figurehead. The New York Times stated, The composition of the cabinet leaves Herr Hitler no scope for the gratification of his dictatorial ambition, end quote. Hitler, in order to get himself into this position, had had to accept some of Papen's demands, since after all, this was meant to be a two-man venture. The only two other Nazis in the cabinet were Goering and Frick. Everyone, as usual, was underestimating Hitler, however. All over Germany, 
the actual German people breathed a sigh of relief. They saw Hitler as their man, or at the very least, a breath of fresh air. One man, who summed up the thoughts of many at the time, is Karl Dönitz, a rising star in the Navy. He felt that at this point in Germany, it was a choice between the National Socialists and the Communists. Obviously, to most people, this was an easy choice, given all the horror stories they had heard from the Soviet Union, or seen firsthand during the dozens of communist uprisings in Germany over the past 15 years. On his fourth day as Chancellor, Hitler was introduced to leaders of the armed forces at a dinner, arrived by the new Ministry of Defence, General von Blomberg. At the dinner, Hitler spoke at length to the room full of generals and admirals about his plans. He told them that the time had come for Germany to regain their place in the world, and first and foremost to do this, the nation must rearm. In its current state, Germany could be easily invaded by neighbours and could be pushed around. With a strong military, however, then this would obviously no longer be the case. To a room full of Prussian aristocrats, this was obviously music to their ears. Next, Hitler set about paralysing his political opposition. Using emergency powers signed by Hindenburg, he pushed through a decree, quote, for the protection of the German people, in which political meetings were cracked down upon, and freedom of speech in the press was restricted. Clearly, Hitler had been preparing for this moment, and he was wasting no time at all. For years, he had been creating what was essentially a state within a state, so that overnight, he could step into power when the time came, and things would just work. He had a man for everything, from education to foreign affairs, and now that he had come to power, hundreds of these Nazi loyalists rose to prominence. Now, all over Germany, there was a new elite. Unlike the UK or elsewhere, where the elite was a class of snobby aristocrats who were only in their position because of their last name, this elite was one of everyday people. These men had thrown their faith behind the Fuhrer early on and dealt with years of unbelievable risk and uncertainty, but now they were rewarded for their loyalty. Those who were already a part of the government were within days being captured by Hitler's fresh take on politics and his boundless energy. The finance minister, Count Lutz Schwerin von Krossig, said, quote, One could not but recognise and admire the qualities which gave him mastery of all discussions, his infallible memory, which enabled him to answer with the most utmost precision questions on the remotest problems under consideration, his presence of mind in discussions, the clarity with which he could reduce the most intricate question to a simple, sometimes too simple, formula, his skill in summing up concisely the results of a long debate, and his cleverness in approaching a well-known and long-discussed problem from a new angle. Whilst the vast majority of Germans were either in support of Hitler or willing to give him a chance, one group that wasn't was the Communists. Almost as soon as Hitler came to power, they began to cause serious trouble, no matter how unlikely their odds of success were. Goering used his position in Prussia to crack down on them. He ordered his police to, quote, avoid at all costs anything suggestive of hostility to the SA, SS and the Stahlheim. As these organisations contain the most constructive national elements, it is the business of the people to abet every form of national propaganda. This was then followed by an order that the police should act decisively against so-called organisations hostile to the state, and that they should use firearms if necessary. This was obviously in reference to the communists. The repression led to greater uproar from the communists, and on the 21st of February, the Union of Red Fighters called upon young communists all over the nation, quote, every comrade a commander in the coming Red Army. This is our oath to the Red soldiers of the Soviet Union. Our fight cannot be broken by machine guns or pistol barrels or prison. We are the masters of tomorrow, end quote. And then a few days later, an official communist newspaper called upon their supporters in a similar vein. Workers, to the barricades, forward to victory, fresh bullets in your guns, draw the pins of the hand grenades, end quote. These calls and the violence that followed them did nothing but increase support for Hitler among the general public, who had already by now had far more than enough of communist antics in the country. When Goering cracked down even harder, most people felt no sympathy at all for these young revolutionaries. On the 24th of February, Goering raided a Communist Party building in Berlin and claimed to have discovered plans for a communist uprising. On the 25th, it seemed as if this was the case, within a single day there was three attempts to set fire to government buildings. The man responsible for these attempted fires was a Dutchman named Marinus van der Lubbe, who had already made up his mind for one of his next targets, the Reichstag itself. Marinus had come to Berlin a week earlier, with the expectation that he would be part of the upcoming communist uprising. Upon arrival, however, turnout to communist meetings were abysmal. 
and he thought the only way to inspire the workers of Germany to rebel was by causing some kind of startling event. Not discouraged by his three previous failed attempts at arson, he purchased some fire lighters and then set off on foot towards the Reichstag on the evening of February the 27th. He scaled the wall and made his way to the balcony on the first floor. At 9.30pm, a student on his way home heard glass breaking inside the building and he saw a figure with a burning object in his hand. His next move was to run to the police officer at the northwest corner of the Reichstag. Within minutes, the fire brigade was on their way and they arrived around 10pm. By then, however, the building was quickly becoming engulfed by flames. Ernst Hampstegel's office was directly opposite the Reichstag and he was awakened from his sickbed by the screams of his housekeeper. He saw what the fuss was about and immediately called Joseph Goebbels, who at first thought it was a joke. He was told to come and see for himself and then Ernst hung up. Hitler was quickly informed and as he saw the red sky above them, he shouted, it's the communists, and they headed towards the scene. Goering was already on the scene, frantically saving the important artwork in the building. He informed Goebbels that it was the communists and that a man had been arrested. Who was it? asked Goebbels, and Goering replied, We don't know yet, but we shall squeeze it out of him. Have no fear, doctor. The police all over town were put on full alert to make sure no other public buildings were set alight. Hitler almost immediately began to see the potential of the event, and as he toured the building, he spoke to his entourage. God grant that this be the work of communists. You are witnessing the beginning of a great epoch in German history. This fire is the beginning. He then tripped over a fire hose, but carried on. If the communists got a hold of Europe and had control of it for six months, what am I saying? Two months. The whole continent would be aflame like this building. Vice-Chancellor Papen turned up and Hitler spoke in much the same vein to him too. This is a God-given signal, Herr Vice-Chancellor. If this fire, as I believe, is the work of the communists, then we must crush out this murderous pest with an iron fist. Papen ran off to consult President Hindenburg on what to do, but Hitler was already making plans of his own. The chief of the political police came to Hitler with the latest on the arsonist. He informed him that the man was acting alone and that his confession sounded true. Hitler was having none of it, however, and was sure that the communist was working with other communists as part of a far larger plan. Hitler stormed off to the offices of his Volkischer Bierbacher newspaper, where he found a few sleepy men sitting around, not putting anywhere near the effort needed into writing about the current event. He and Goebbels did it themselves, and they sat up and worked until sunrise, preparing the next editions. By the following morning, both the radio stations and the public at large were clamouring for the arrest of communist members of the Reichstag. Hitler was more than happy to oblige with the anti-communist sentiment. He played his hand and requested an emergency decree to protect the nation from the communists. The decree called for the suspension of free speech, free press, secrecy of mail and telephone conversations, and the right to assemble or form organisations. Next, it authorised the Minister of the Interior to seize control temporarily of any state which was unable to maintain order. Not a single minister opposed the motion. That evening, Papen and Hitler reported to President Hindenburg, and he signed it without comment. Almost immediately, truckloads of SA and SS men were helping the police enforce the decree, and they crashed into known taverns or meeting places of communists, and they were carted off to prison. Over 3,000 communists and social democrats were taken into protective custody by the regular police. Goering addressed the nation the next day, and he talked of the apparent communist plan to don brown shirt uniforms and carry out terrorist acts in an attempt to destroy the newly found unity of the German nation. He then told the public not to worry, quote, I may say to the communists that my nerves have not yet collapsed, but I feel myself strong enough to give the knockout blow to their criminal plans. All over Germany, the people were more than happy to believe Goering, since this didn't sound outside the realm of possibility, given how many violent and bloody communist uprisings had already taken place. The foreign press, however, with no first-hand experience of communism, were quick to express scepticism. London newspapers, whose owners were staunchly anti-Nazi, began pumping out hit pieces, suggesting that the National Socialists themselves had started the fire as a pretext to crush the communists. The newspaper barons, and those with grudges against Hitler's movement all over the world, pushed this story as far as they could, and eventually, it became part of the history book for decades, as if it was a fact. And even today, millions still believe that this is what happened. On March the 2nd, Sefton Delmer, the famous British-Australian journalist who was brought up in Germany, came to Hitler for answers. Hitler rallied against the foreigners for making such accusations when they should be grateful to him for preventing the spread of communism. He then went on to make a speech. When the communist menace is stamped out, the normal order of things shall return. Our laws are too liberal for me to deal effectively and swiftly with this Bolshevik underworld. But I myself am only too anxious for the normal state of affairs to be restored 
as quickly as possible. First, however, we must crush the communists out of existence. Despite the foreign press twisting the story, the fire did have massive advantages for Hitler at home. With the elections right around the corner, Adolf Hitler could not have asked for better timing. Almost nobody objected when brown shares turned up all over the nation to rip down red election posters and replace them with their own. The Communist Party wasn't officially outlawed by Hitler, but their reputation was in tatters. The NSDAP played up the communist bloodbath that would have swept over the country had they not taken the harsh measures against them. To an audience in Frankfurt, Goering was rather explicit with what he planned to do next. My measures will not be crippled by any bureaucracy. I won't have to worry about justice. My mission is only to destroy and exterminate. This struggle will be a struggle against chaos, and I shall not conduct it with police power. A bourgeois state might have done that. Certainly, I shall use the power of the state and the police to the utmost, my dear communists, so don't draw any false conclusions. But I shall lead the brown shirts in this struggle to the death, and my claws will grasp your necks. End quote. The population loved this rhetoric, and the non NSDAP politicians reassured themselves that all this violent talk was just bluster, and that they were the real ones running things. The industrialists, who had been rather helpful in getting Hitler to power, now doubled down on him and helped finance the elections. Goering reassured them in an appeal for funds. The sacrifice, we ask, is easier to bear if you realise that the elections will certainly be the last for the next 10 years, probably for the next 100 years. Three million marks were raised by these industrialists, including the banker Schacht and Krupp of the gigantic steel company. With so much money at their disposal, the campaign trail was a walk in the park. All over the nation, speeches were broadcast over radios and loudspeakers on the streets, and the National Socialists, still running on the biggest high of their lifetimes now Hitler was finally in power, threw themselves into the campaign more enthusiastically than ever. The SA and the SS were no longer repressed by the police, and the police now essentially looked upon them as auxiliaries and were willing to turn a blind eye to any excesses committed in the name of patriotism. The election was never in question, and this was life now, and the German people as a whole were happy with it. This was helped by his toning down in language. No longer was the fiery rhetoric needed as much now that he was in power. The future first president of West Germany, Theodor Huss, said, he rants much less. He has stopped breathing fire at the Jews and can make a speech nowadays lasting four hours without mentioning the word Jew, end quote. Hitler was so loved across the board that in fact, even some Jews supported him. The Jewish National Union openly supported his party and especially Hitler's proposed ban on the entry of Eastern Jews. As expected, the National Socialists won their majority in parliament with the help of their nationalist allies and Hitler immediately got to work on securing the nation totally. Bavaria, the home of the NSDAP, was becoming rather troublesome, and on March the 9th, Gauleiter, Adolf Varga, and Captain Ernst Rom appeared at the office of Bavarian Minister President Held. They demanded that a state commissar be put in place, and that General Ritter von Epp be given the task, due to his experience with crushing the Soviet Republic in 1919. The Bavarian president desperately wired protests to Berlin, but Hindenburg simply told him to address all future complaints directly to Chancellor Hitler. Bavaria was now in the hands of the National Socialists. Hitler celebrated this triumph by flying to Munich, and he was greeted like a war hero, returning from a glorious victory. The people went absolutely wild, and the mood was euphoric. Hitler said, quote, Munich is the city of Germany closest to my heart. Here, as a young man, as a soldier, and as a politician, I made my start. The city is also itself baptised in the blood of those who died in 1923. Hitler saw himself as a new Bismarck, integrating Germans and helping them to overcome their interstate rivalries. He said to the local party leaders, quote, Your assignment, gentlemen, is difficult, but it is important for the political stability of the nation that the power of the Reich no longer be disturbed by special movements or even separatist disturbances in Bavaria. I must finish the work of Bismarck. States are states, only as long as they are useful for the good of the Reich, end quote. Hitler, in an act of respect to Hindenburg and that bygone era of Prussia and Imperial Germany, he chose the Potsdam Garrison Church for the opening of the new Reichstag on March the 21st. The ancient town, founded by Frederick Wilhelm I and containing the grave of Hitler's idol Frederick the Great, was decorated with swastika banners as well as the black, white and red flags of the former empire. Men were everywhere, marching in formation, and an absolute spectacle was put on to make the right impression. The crowd rose as Hindenburg appeared, and the old man saluted the empty seat of the Kaiser, and the royalty lined up behind it. Hitler looked tiny standing next to the gigantic field marshal, and a little ill at ease, 
But in general, things went well. Hindenburg made his speech, appealing for the revival of the disciplined and patriotic spirit of old Prussia. Hitler then made his, and spoke on the history of Germany from the Great War until now, and finished by paying respect to Hindenburg. We consider it a blessing to have your consent to the work of the German Rising. Hitler then walked with the president and his son into the crypt of Frederick the Great and Frederick Wilhelm I, and they laid wreaths on the tombs to the well-timed sound of cannon salutes outside. The imagery could not have been better, and the entire day was stage managed by Goebbels. Everyone in attendance, the military, the Junkers, and the monarchists, were all won over to Hitler's cause, and were fooled into believing that Hitler would be subservient to Hindenburg, and follow the Prussian way of doing things. Two days later, Hitler made his first appearance in front of the Reichstag, and laid out his aims to all in attendance. He vowed to respect private property, promised aid to peasants and the middle class alike, and most importantly, he promised to promote peace with France, Britain, and even the Soviet Union. There was a catch though, he said. To do all this, he needed the enactment of the law for alleviating the distress of people and Reich. This enabling act would give him temporary but overriding authority in Germany, but he made it sound moderate to those in attendance. Hitler then rather ominously told them that the choice was up to them, but if they refused, then the new regime would be willing to fight for its principles, quote, it is for you, gentlemen of the Reichstag, to decide between war and peace, he said. The Social Democrats went berserk, and the leader made a poorly delivered speech in protest. Hitler replied in a way reminiscent of his beer hall days in Munich. I do not want your votes. Germany will be free, but not through you. Do not mistake us for the bourgeoisie. The star of Germany is in the ascendant. Yours is about to disappear. Your death knell has sounded. End quote. The vote was then taken, and it passed with 441 being for the bill, and 94 against. The National Socialists then leapt to their feet cheering, and then, with outstretched hands, recited the Horst Wessel song. Democracy in Germany was now effectively dead, and no one raised a finger. The Centre Party, who decided to support Hitler's motion, even got a letter from Hindenburg thanking him for supporting Hitler. It read, I wish to assure you that the Chancellor has expressed his willingness, even without formal constitutional obligations, to take measures based on the Enabling Act, only after consultations with me, end quote. After the victory in the Reichstag, Hitler received a letter of congratulations from Krupp, the steel magnate. Krupp had become a true Nazi, and would openly salute others on the street as a greeting. He was rewarded for his support of Hitler thus far by being appointed as the Tsar of German industry. Another rewarded for his support of Hitler was Hjalmar Schacht, who was made president of the Reichsbank. One of his first acts upon getting into office was the invention of a system of so-called MIFO bills which is far too complicated of a topic to get in depth on this video on, but essentially, it was a way to sort of give unlimited credit to the Hitler regime. A full-blown revolution was taking place, but because it was bloodless, most Germans were either in support of it or condoned it. All aspects of political, economic, and social life were being placed under control of those in, or loyal to, the NSDAP, and day by day, the nation was drawing closer to becoming Hitler's personal dictatorship. Outside of Berlin, street names were already being changed, and organisations set up. For example, there was now many roads named Adolf Hitler Platz, or Hermann Goeringstrasse. All over the nation, new groups like the Mother and Child Welfare Organisation, the Country School for Mothers, or the Food Supply Welfare Organisation, were set up and run by the National Socialists in order to help those still in poverty. One group that wasn't ignoring Hitler's moves was the Jewish people, but more specifically, foreign Jews. As soon as Hitler came to power, many different movements sprung up, many headed by extremely influential men, all with the same goal, boycott Hitler's anti-Semitic regime. They did so, and by March 1933, the call was heard all over the world, especially in the UK and the USA. On March the 24th, 1933, the Daily Express ran the headline, Judea declares war on Germany. And whilst rather dramatic, this was what was happening, if you can call an economic war, a war. This, coupled with atrocity propaganda abroad, which Hitler believed to be the work of highly influential Jewish newspaper barons, led to the famous boycott of Jewish businesses in Germany, which was announced on April the 1st. He proclaimed the one day long boycott with these words, I believe that I act today in unison with the almighty creator's intention. By fighting the Jews, I do battle for the Lord." End quote. Brown shirts were posted in front of the doors of most Jewish stores and would remind customers when they were about to walk in that they were about to give money to a Jewish business. 
Signs were posted outside the stores, informing Germans not to walk in, and that this boycott was retaliatory. The boycott had mixed success, and whilst it might have increased anti-Semitism in Germany by bringing attention to the ongoing Jewish boycott of German goods abroad, it probably only further inflamed those doing the boycotting abroad, who were itching for reasons to get at Hitler. In July, a group of some of the most influential Jews in the world met in Amsterdam to set up a more official boycott. The organiser was Samuel Untermeyer, and he said that this act was a quote, holy war, a war that must be waged unremittingly against a veritable hell of cruel and savage beasts. Hindenburg protested to Hitler about the anti-Jewish measures and said in a letter in reference to Jewish war veterans, quote, if they were worthy of fighting and bleeding for Germany, they must be considered worthy of continuing to serve the fatherland in their profession. Hitler countered, however, by reminding Hindenburg that the famous Prussian state that Hindenburg loved so much only allowed Jews very limited access to the civil service, but he nevertheless gave some vague promises to give extra consideration to war veterans. This was enough to placate Hindenburg, and on the 7th of April, a decree was enacted removing all Jews from civil service positions, as Hitler saw them as a foreign element, and didn't trust them in such an important position in German society. A few weeks later, the schools were next, and whilst not as thorough as the civil service clean-out, a number of Jews in higher institutions were removed. Many, including a few bishops, complained, and Hitler in response offered them a history lesson. He reminded them that the Catholic Church had forbidden Christians to work with Jews for centuries and confined them to ghettos, and told them that he was simply continuing their work in an effort to protect the state and the church. Many Jews didn't feel these measures were directed against them, however, and simply carried on as normal. Others, however, wanted a way out, and Hitler was more than happy to oblige. The Havara Agreement was signed in August 1933 between Hitler and many prominent Zionists. The agreement set up a system for Jews in Germany to be relocated to Palestine, where the Jewish population was ballooning, and the foundations for the Israeli state were being set up. The agreement led to a loosening of the boycott on Germany in some circles, but others remained steadfast in their boycott, and many continued all the way into the outbreak of war in 1939, when obviously foreign trade didn't matter so much anyway. Almost as soon as Hitler came to power, he had been pushing for the removal of trade unions. Hitler declared May the 1st as National Labour Day. The main rally was held that same evening at Tempelhof Airfield, where hundreds of thousands of workers gathered to hear Hitler speak about the dignity of labour and the need for national unity. As always, the speech ended with passionate applause, and the crowd began to sing the Horst Vessel song. As the cheers died down, fireworks then lit up the sky. The next morning, however, the SA, the SS, and the police seized union offices all over the nation. Bank accounts were confiscated, union newspapers were shut down, and before nightfall, unions had been wiped from the face of Germany. This wasn't done without a plan, however, and the workers would offer it an extremely enticing alternative. The German labour front was established by the state, and the workers were promised that their rights would be protected. Essentially, Hitler was arguing that unions were no longer needed, since the state itself had the workers' interests in mind, unlike a capitalist system. In Hitler's Germany, the state itself would run a nationwide union which was in keeping with Hitler's vision of a Germany united without class divisions. By the end of the month, the vast army of German workers, a large amount of whom had previously been communists, were happily marching behind the swastika. The German labour front, ran by Robert Ley, is one of the most interesting chapters in the early stages of the National Socialist's time in power, and is worthy of a half an hour video of its own. One of the most beloved aspects of this new labour front, worth mentioning here though, is the Strength Through Joy program. The DAF offered activities to the average German worker that were simply unattainable beforehand and only enjoyed by a privileged few. At the low end, you had things such as tennis classes and other simple activities offered to workers for free so that they could enjoy their leisure time. At the high end, you had opportunities which would seem completely alien to the average manual labourer in the West today. State subsidised cruises were offered to workers and ships full of just normal everyday people were sent off on luxury trips such as the 18-day trips to the Portuguese island of Madeira or a 7-day trip to the Norwegian fjords. Hitler did not act as belligerently abroad as he did at home however. Hitler had reshaped half of German society into his own image within months and despite how ruthless it seemed, the German people didn't mind, 
as they saw it as all for a good cause. Franklin Roosevelt made a plea for world peace in mid-May, and Hitler replied to him that he would welcome the USA, becoming the guarantor of peace in Europe. Quote, The German government wishes to come to a peaceful agreement with other nations, and all difficult questions. Germany knows that in any military action in Europe, even if completely successful, the sacrifice will be out of all proportion to any possible gains, end quote. In this regard, he was correct. Ever since the First World War, warfare was simply too industrial and large scale to possibly result in more good than bad coming of it, unless there was no other option. At this stage, Hitler genuinely didn't appear to want war with any other nation, and even thinking of such a thing, especially this early on, would be suicidal given how pitiful the size of the German army was. The speech not only placated foreign rulers, especially in the Anglosphere, but also Hindenburg at home. Hindenburg was genuinely coming around to Hitler, despite having his issues with him. Hitler was always polite to the old man, and after a few months of being in office, he finally seemed to have gained his trust. Within three weeks, Hitler recalled, we had progressed so far that his attitude towards me became affectionate and paternal. On the 22nd of June, Hitler continued his work at home and made his next aggressive move. The Social Democrat Party was outlawed and declared as, quote, hostile to the nation and state. Its members were expelled from the Reichstag. A few days later, the State Party voluntarily disbanded, and then two weeks after this, the German People's Party did the same. Hitler spoke to the Reich governors, saying, we must now eliminate the last remnants of democracy. He did just this, and on the 14th of July, Germany officially became a one-party state. Vice-Chancellor Papen said, when we discussed the measure in the cabinet, there was practically no opposition. Opposition was forming within his own party, however, from below. The SA's fanatical brown shirts had been waiting years for this moment, and they felt Adolf Hitler was moving too slowly. Hitler did not want a revolution in the communist sense of completely upending the old regime and engaging in a reign of terror. Hitler wanted to do things carefully and bloodlessly. He said to his Gauleiters, quote, To gain political power, we had to conquer rapidly with a single blow. In the economic sphere, other principles of development must determine our actions. Here, progress must be made step by step, without any radical breaking up of the existing conditions, which would endanger the foundations of our life, end quote. Another group which were experiencing the exact opposite phenomenon to the SA were their street rivals, the communists. For years, communists had fought and died against the brown shirts, but now that their leaders were in disarray or in camps, more and more began to drift towards national socialism. With no propaganda from the unions or the communist party to fill their ears, they began to see the benefits of swapping sides. Communists in Germany had long called for a long and bloody revolution to secure workers' rights and a new society. But suddenly, these former Reds woke up in a society where workers did indeed have these new rights, and with a new, unified society seemingly on the horizon too, no longer would they have to feel the shame of being looked down upon. To Hitler and the National Socialists, everyone was a German, and that was it, whether they were in Hitler's words a hand or a brain worker, to top matters off, the economy had immediately taken a turn for the better. No longer were the streets filled with beggars, and it appeared as if a boom was imminent. On the 20th of July, a concordat between the Vatican and Hitler was signed. Hitler, a Catholic, although not a devout one himself, was eager to ensure that there was no religious tensions in his new united Germany, and that religion did not interfere with matters of the state. The church agreed to keep out of politics, and in return, Hitler, among other things, granted complete freedom to confessional schools throughout the country. Vice-Chancellor Papen, another Catholic, was sent as the representative, and the two got on brilliantly. Pope Pius XI welcomed Papen, quote, most graciously, and remarked how pleased he was that the German government now had at its head a man uncompromisingly opposed to communism and Russian nihilism in all its forms. The Vatican was so impressed with Hitler's movement that it asked God himself to bless the Reich, and they ordered German bishops to swear allegiance to the National Socialist regime. During mid to late 1933, a whole list of animal welfare laws, which were the first of their kind, were passed. In 1931, the NSDAP had proposed a ban on vivisection, but it didn't get enough support from the other parties. Now that the nation was a dictatorship, however, the party could now get these laws passed, which were very close to their hearts. Goering, the world-renowned animal lover, was at the head of this movement. On April the 21st, a law was passed banning the slaughter of animals without anaesthetic. On the 16th of August, a total ban on vivisection was enacted, and Goering announced the quote, end of the unbearable torture and suffering in animal experiments. 
On the 28th, he said in a radio broadcast, quote, an absolute and permanent ban on vivisection is not only a necessary law to protect animals and show sympathy with their pain, but it is also a law for humanity itself. I have therefore announced the immediate prohibition of vivisection and made the practice a punishable offence in Prussia. Until such time as punishment is pronounced, the culprit shall be lodged in a camp. Commercial animal trapping was also banned, and severe restrictions were placed on hunting, as well as a ban on boiling lobsters and crabs alive. On the 24th of November, 1933, Nazi Germany enacted another law called the Reich Animal Protection Act. Prohibitions were introduced on using animals for filmmaking or other public events that caused pain or damage to animal health. Feeding fowls forcefully and tearing out the thighs of living frogs were examples of other things that were banned. It was announced that animals were to be protected for their own sake. On February 23rd, 1934, a decree was enacted which introduced education on animal protection to all levels of the schooling system. Soon afterwards, Nazi Germany became the first state in the world to place the wolf under state protection. The same year, an international conference on animal welfare was held in Berlin. Back in 1933, Hitler chose to spend his summer in his mountain retreat on the Obersalzburg. He invited the Hampstegels, but Ernst was busy, so he sent his wife and 12-year-old son, Egon. There was also many others who lived in nearby houses, most prominently Goering, who spent a lot of time with them, as well as Hitler's sister, who was the lady of the house. If Hitler expected peace and quiet with friends, however, he wasn't going to get it. It had become known that Hitler was staying there, and tourists from all over Germany began to appear. One day, little Egon was being requested by the crowd over and over again to bring Hitler out, and eventually he did so. Hitler took the boy outside and with a wide smile greeted the admiring masses. Egon said, they nearly swooned. After he went back in, they thanked me profusely, and one hysterical woman picked up some pebbles on which Hitler had stepped and put them in a little vial, which she crushed ecstatically against her breast. Then, Egon was bombarded with postcards, photos, and pieces of paper by the crowd for the Fuhrer to sign. My god boy, you don't give up either, do you? said Hitler with a smile when Egon brought them to him. Even in the UK, Hitler was winning over the sceptical public. The newspapers at home in England had forgotten two things. Atrocity propaganda doesn't really work as well without war or a crisis, and that the British public loves an underdog. The British attitude towards Hitler's revisionist views of the Versailles Treaty was driving the French mad. The Brits felt that Germany had been treated far too harshly, and that their brutality at home was, quote, largely the reflex of the external persecution to which Germans have been subjected since the war. At least, according to Lord Lothian, the British attacks on the Versailles Treaty were second only to those in Germany, and many felt sorry for, or at least to a degree, understood Hitler. A serious shouting dictator was still alien to the light-hearted and stoic British public, however, so this isn't to say that they were in love with the man. He was simply the underdog of Europe who had risen from the ashes, and many wished to see him succeed. The British people didn't make decisions, however, and whilst Hitler cared deeply for the British public, he needed to win over their leaders too. He hoped that the British would be a silent partner in his crusade against communism. After all, is that not what Winston Churchill had been banging on about for almost two decades now? To win over the Brits, however, Hitler had to convince them that the New Reich would renounce world trade and global naval ambitions. Hitler, in the best case scenario, wanted the British as a staunch ally. He saw the British people as fellow Aryans, and thought that if the snobby British elite were not in the way, the two nations could build a prosperous future side by side. Britannia could rule the waves, whilst Germany economically dominated the continent, as it always does when left to its own devices, much like today. These were just dreams, however. In autumn 1933, the French and British were talking a big game of disarmament, and how Germany could not increase her armed forces, but they were unwilling to disarm themselves. When Hitler requested that he be allowed a military, equal to that of the other powers he was running up against a brick wall. France was more than happy to berate the Germans about remaining disarmed, but when asked to reduce her own armed forces, she was too scared to do so, of fear of being invaded by Germany. Germany, on the other hand, wasn't allowed this same luxury, despite the fact that France had literally invaded Germany during the Ruhr occupation just 10 years prior. Hitler had had enough, and felt like he was just walking around in circles trying to reason with these people. As a result, he pulled Germany out of the League of Nations on the 14th of October, announcing by radio that, to be written down as a member of such an institution, possessing no such equality of rights is, for an honour-loving nation of 65 million people, and for a government which loves honour, an intolerable humiliation, end quote. 
One man, who was worried by Hitler's actions, was Mussolini. Perhaps jealous that Hitler had outshone him on the world stage ever since he had come to power, Il Duce would take every opportunity he could to swipe at Hitler and try to side with the French and British against him until it became politically necessary to do the opposite when he saw the tide changing. Mussolini was apparently, quote, very much upset at the step and deplored it extremely and, quote, saw no way out of the situation and did not know how Germany intended on making any further progress, end quote. He also felt that the move was a blow to his own prestige as a fellow dictator in Europe. In early 1934, Hitler received his first important foreign visitor, future Prime Minister Anthony Eden from Britain. Eden was immediately impressed. He knew what he was speaking about, and as the long interviews proceeded, he showed himself completely master of his subject, he said. Hitler's precondition to any international agreement was the possibility of self-defence. Hitler even promised to guarantee that the SA and the SS would be deprived of arms if an agreement was reached. As a goodwill gesture to prove his desire for reconciliation with Britain, Hitler visited the British Embassy for lunch, the first time he had ever entered a foreign embassy. After lunch, Hitler made more detailed proposals to the Brits. He was willing to accept just 30% of the combined number of military aircraft possessed by his neighbours, and was prepared to agree that the number of German aircraft should never exceed 60% of those in the French Air Force. He even offered Eden to trim down the SA and SS, adding, quote, that his own common sense would never allow him to sanction the creation of a second army in the state. Never, never. It wasn't only the Brits that Hitler was making gestures to, however. On the 14th of March, the following note was cabled to Ambassador Dodd to pass on to President Roosevelt. The Reich Chancellor requests Mr. Dodd to present his greetings to President Roosevelt. He congratulates the President upon his heroic effort in the interest of the American people. The President's successful struggle against economic distress is being followed by the entire German people with interest and admiration. The Reich Chancellor is in accord with the President that the virtues of sense of duty, readiness for sacrifice and discipline must be the supreme rule of the whole nation. This moral demand, which the President is addressing to every single citizen, is only the quintessence of German philosophy of the state, expressed in its motto, the public wheel before private gain, end quote. The message fell short, however, as it couldn't have come at a worse time. In Madison Square Garden a week earlier, the American Jewish Congress had held a mock trial entitled Civilization Against Hitlerism, a presentation of factual records of law, an act of the Hitler regime, and many important men were in attendance, even the mayor. As expected, civilization won the trial, and opinions were being swayed against Hitler by this act, among many others. Hitler continued to try and win over the French and the British, so that they could all come to some kind of mutual arrangement in Europe for the sake of peace in the future. Quote, the British were eager to get it all over with. They sent us note upon note, urging us to state what guarantees seemed to us to strengthen security sufficiently to gain our consent to a relative rearmament of the Reich, said French ambassador Francois Poncet. The ambassador was one of those who agreed with the British to an extent. Better a limited and controlled armament than unlimited, uncontrolled and unrepressed armament of the Reich, end quote. And he felt that even a mediocre agreement was better than none. When he travelled to Paris to attempt to win over his superiors, however, he made no headway. In an interview with Prime Minister Dumerge, he was, quote, not permitted to breathe one word, and every time he tried to bring up the subject, he was shut down. The French were intent on not making any agreement, and instead headed their own way. They intended to check Hitler's ambitions by setting up an anti-Nazi bloc in the East called the Little Entente, and agreements were signed with the Czechs, the Romanians, and the Yugoslavs. Poland and the USSR were also approached, and the French were trying to scare Hitler into submission. That spring, when the French and the Soviets were approaching an agreement, Hitler quite understandably feared that he was being encircled, which he was. To counter this, he reached out to the best prospect he had as an alliance, Italy. Mussolini may have looked down his nose at Hitler in the past, and he would continue to do so, but Hitler was a big fan of the Duce and admired him greatly. Hitler wrote to Mussolini, quote, Admiration for the historic efforts of your excellency is linked with the desire for cooperation in a spirit of true friendship for our two ideologically related nations, which can contribute immeasurably to the tranquilization of Europe through suitable attention to identical interests." End quote. Hermann Goering delivered the letter personally. Hans Stegel, Hitler's foreign press secretary, 
headed off to meet Mussolini also a few weeks later to convince Mussolini to meet with Hitler. You are both admirers of Wagner, and that will give a common starting point. Think what it would mean if you invited him to the Palazzo Vendramin in Venice, where Richard Wagner died. He would gain the benefit of your long experience and obtain much needed insight into the problems of Europe as seen from outside Germany." End quote. Mussolini wasn't opposed to the idea and sent off an invitation which Hitler accepted. The meeting was an absolute disaster. Supposedly, Mussolini from the start was only interested in meeting Hitler to see what all the curiosity was about and said to a confidant, Hitler is simply a muddle-headed fool. His head is stuffed with philosophical and political tags that are utterly incoherent. I can't make out why he waited so long to take power and why he played the buffoon with his ridiculous electoral contests in order to take legal possession of the reins of power. Either he is a revolutionary or he is not. Fascist Italy would never have come into being without a march on Rome. We are dynamic and Signor Hitler is just a prater. Mussolini's attitude towards Hitler was so well known that the press all turned out en masse to see this quote, strange freak Hitler. When Adolf walked out of his aircraft on the 14th of June, he was dressed in an ill-fitting suit and looked scruffy next to the Duce. He was wearing a black shirt, jack boots, and a glittering gold braid, and was backed up by Italian troops in full dress. When Hitler disembarked, Mussolini threw up a Roman salute so hard that one correspondent said he might lose his hand. Hitler looked ill at ease, and he was evidently embarrassed on his first foreign visit. He kept fiddling with his fedora and didn't know what to do with it. He took it off to salute the Italian flag and then went to put it back on, but stopped himself and then began shifting it awkwardly between his hands. After a series of other faux pas, which embarrassed Hitler, he finally arrived at his hotel suite where he began to berate his advisors for allowing him to turn up in civilian clothing to meet the Duce who turned up in full military style. His first discussion with Mussolini was a disaster too, as the awkward Hitler was dominated in conversation and could barely get a word in edgeways. To top it off, Mussolini's strange German accent was almost incomprehensible to Hitler, and in return, Mussolini could barely make out Hitler's Austrian German. The next morning, it was Mussolini's turn to be embarrassed, however. The duo reviewed a parade of fascist troops, and two columns began to argue about who had the right of way, and in the end, they just both marched right past each other, causing chaos. Hitler asked his new adjutant, Lieutenant Wiedmann, a man who had served with him in the trenches in World War I, what he thought of the military value of such troops. Wiedmann awkwardly replied that he was sure this had nothing to do with their combat ability, but Hitler had trouble believing this, when at that very moment he glanced out of the window towards an Italian warship, which to his amazement had an array of sailors' shirts and underwear flying from the masts instead of the usual flags. The most important and last meeting was held at the Lido Golf Course. This time, Hitler seemed more comfortable, and the roles were reversed. Hitler talked ceaselessly, while Mussolini listened silently with a scowl on his face. Perhaps Hitler got a little carried away and offended Mussolini. At one point, he talked about the superiority of the Nordic race and then spoke of the quote, Negroid strain in the Mediterranean peoples, which had led to their downfall. In the end, Mussolini was so sick of the Fuhrer that he quickly left in a hurry and stated that he didn't want to see anybody. Hitler ended up leaving Venice, gaining nothing, and losing something rather important and close to his heart. He had agreed to respect Austrian independence, and in return got no clear promise in regards to the disarmament question. State Secretary Ernst von Weissacker of the Foreign Office confided to a Swiss official that he, quote, could not foresee any closer collaboration between the two men. And so, in 1934, Hitler had managed to annoy Mussolini, one of his heroes, and was in a precarious international situation with France trying to encircle him. At home, however, he was adored by his people, and the support for him only grew and grew. He was effectively a dictator of a one-party state, and he finally had what he had wanted for the entire 15 long years of the party's existence. Next time, we will cover perhaps the most dramatic move of Hitler's career so far, the Night of the Long Knives. Thank you so much for the support lately. It means the world. As always, my patrons are the ones keeping this channel afloat, and by extension, myself, and I cannot thank them enough. If you'd like to become one yourself and support the channel during its early stages, join our Discord and our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please sign up in the link in the description. And my Telegram and my alternate donation platforms are there too. Thank you. Thank you to my patrons, Lobster to You, Darway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E. Lanza, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, 
Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wonder Waffer, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, and John Higgins. Also, thank you to my subscriber on Subscribestar, Inflection Point.